Welcome into NFL Bad Beats. I'm Tim Kalinowski, joined by Nick Giffen. We just wrapped up, or about to wrap up, NFL Week 10. And these aren't just the classic bad beats, you know, last play, how did this happen? But, you know, a hidden bad beat that's defined by win probability and things that often get unnoticed. And this is important to note when you're going back and doing a little self-scouting for, hey, did I really deserve this win? And also, too, for future games, hey, this team continues to get lucky, <clears throat> the Pittsburgh Steelers. But anyway, we'll get into all of that. Nick. You have uh, your first bad beat on the board. This one was played over in Germany, 9.30 a.m. start um, for people in the Eastern time zone in the United States. And if you fell asleep or didn't wake up, I don't blame you for this game. We're going to go into what exactly happened. Uh, the actual score of this game was Indianapolis 10, New England 6. But Nick, um, Patriots fans, I guess they do don't want to hear this. They should have won the game. Yeah, um, and you know, even before we get into the plays, the bad beat was really... I took Indianapolis as the lowest scoring team. I should have taken this as the lowest scoring game because <laughs> our luck rankings, which of course is what uh, the expected scores from these games are what power these bad beats, power our luck rankings. They also power our luck totals. This game by far had the lowest luck total on the board of the whole Sunday slate. And instead I went with Indy's team total. Well, they did only score 10 points. They outscored the New England Patriots 10 to six in a game that should have been by expected score, New England 20, Indy 15. That is a 40% win probability swing. So uh, definitely New England Patriots uh, unlucky in this one. Yeah, I guess we'll get rolling, Nick. The, the Patriots, these are a lot of the errors that they have continued to make all season long, and it starts right here. This should be an easy field goal by any metric, no matter who's yeah. kicking it. Yeah, I mean, this is a 90 to 95% field goal uh you know extra points are around 95 percent, and this is a little shorter than extra point it is on the right hash which i guess makes it slightly a bit tougher but not really um you got to make that chad ryland yeah and ryland he's one of the worst kickers in the league correct uh i, I believe he honestly is. i haven't looked that up but either way you should still be making those 35 yarders right there so um, we get to the know, same that's, that's we get to the same conclusion almost under yeah it's almost three points under expectations like 2.8 points there uh, and now the Patriots here, um, they don't do well really on any area of the field, but especially goal to go situations. They've been brutal in the red zone and it continued here. Yeah. I, again, first and goal from the nine. And then you have second and goal from the five that actually that second and goal from the five play uh, at that point, uh, the expectation was 5.3 points scored from that drive so uh, very often a touchdown occasionally settling for a field goal and very rarely getting no points out of the drive they do end up settling for the field goal so coming in a couple points below expectation when they had that second and five as well so you know a bunch of times they punch it in but in this case they didn't yeah they it's it's been it's it's been tough for patriots fans uh like myself well how about this after all that they still have a chance to win the game. The ball is in Mac Jones's hands. About four minutes or so left in the fourth quarter and a brutal, brutal interception. He's got Gasicki wide open in the end zone. And I don't, I don't understand how he makes that throw so, so poorly. Uh, but yeah, that the, the play right before that as well was a first and 10 uh, where they had a, the Patriots had an expectation of almost five points from that drive. And of course, Mac Jones interception, where he has a wide open guy, they end up coming away with zero. So once again, just under expectation, under expectation, even adjusting, we always say this every week, even adjusting for the fact that it's Mac Jones and the Patriots offense, which has struggled, still under expectations. And um, just to, uh, as we as we go here again, so the Patriots are going to bench Mac Jones with about two minutes left. And now, hey, turn the keys over to Bailey Zappi and... Um, Fake spike, all sorts of nonsense going on here, but it's the same ending as it has been with Mac Jones, a poor interception. Yeah, zappy hour turned into crappy hour there with that fake spike, and uh, I don't know what the heck that was. Why do, They could have just taken their time a little bit. I understand the clock was running and set up something, but that whole sequence was just weird, especially in that last play, and uh, just uh, not a good play there at all. You know, they could have... <laughs> They, they have so much time. They have no timeouts, but at least, you know, even if you throw an incompletion or, or, or something like that, you stop the clock. If you, if you clock the ball and you actually spike it, there's a lot of ways that could have gone a lot better. Uh, instead, 
the weird fake spike into a sea of indie defenders. We have seen countless NFL teams with that amount of time left and us say that is way too much time. And so the Patriots, yeah. you know, obviously didn't do that. And it really doesn't matter. Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, the interceptions there. I ask you this every week because it is interesting to me. Does it matter that the quarterback already sucks in terms of your luck rate, your luck gap and your percentage for them to it, succeed and get points there? It does matter, but we adjust for that. Right. So, um, you know, if it's, Pat Mahomes in that situation, we're going to have a higher expectation than if it's Mac Jones in that situation. So um, our luck rankings adjust for that, our expected scores and everything like that, adjust for the quality of the offense and the quality of the opposing defense. Yeah, and it was kind of a, a cumulative effect there at five points here, 2.8 points there, which in this game would feel like 40 points that they left on the board. So yeah. there you go, Patriots fans. Uh, that was a fun one on a Sunday morning to kick us off. Let's go all the way back to Thursday night, the Bears and the Panthers. Um, another yeah, another real exciting one, guys. Uh, NFL primetime. The actual score of this game, Chicago wins 19-13. to 13, But – um, Oh, excuse me. 16, 13. Yeah. I, you know, I, I have stigmatism. I, you know, so do the, I. yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, that's I, why I got I'm, these. I'm not, <laughs> I don't wear mine because I'm, I'm an idiot. So the expected score in this game though, uh, Chicago should have won 19 to six, which would have been a Chicago cover as the spread in this game was in the three to four range. Chicago was laying it. Let's go into um, some of the unlucky or lucky plays. We're going to get, a punt return here, 79 yards. That's about as lucky as it gets, right, Nick? Oh, yeah, certainly. I think this is something like the fifth punt return for a touchdown this year. He almost gets tackled right when he gets the ball there. Almost gets tackled again. You know, a couple broken tackles, and then he just has to beat the kicker. Uh, there are opportunities there for that to have gone completely different. And it, with so few punt return touchdowns, that's just – always going to be way above expectation. We're not expecting punt return touchdown that put, um, you know, nearly five and a half points on the board for the Panthers above expectation, right? So seven points scored there and on an average punt return with an average uh, Panthers drive against this bears defense, the Panthers were expected to score about one and a half points from that change of possession came away with seven. Yeah, and you've pointed out to me before when we were actually talking about the Bears a couple of weeks ago, um, the Bears, you know, that, that was the game with, with DJ Moore and a million uh, third down conversions that actually ended up in touchdowns. And you said to me, this is a Bears team that not only shouldn't do that, but shouldn't do that if we're judging them based off the Bears. I think that punt return is indicative of Carolina. Yeah. We This is what it takes for them to score. And that is, you know, an indictment on that offense in that team. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if that's the way you're scoring, uh, it's not going to be sustainable in the long run. Uh, you know, you, you're going to have to have your offense move the ball in Carolina, even against this Bears defense uh, was just not able to do so. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to go here, the Bears knocking on the door. And you would think maybe from the naked eye that this doesn't mean too much, but field goals here, Nick, they have to settle for field goals. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean a ton. You know, you got a third and seven play there and they take a shot. They don't get it. But there was a chance they could have gotten a first down. There was a chance they could have gotten a first down on first or second down. Uh, instead, they end up settling for a field goal here. So that comes in a little bit under expectation. Um, and then we do it again. The last drive of the second half, they are unable to punch the ball. And now time was running short. So this one, you know, didn't have as much of an expectation as the previous drive. But altogether, uh, they make two field goals when these two drives had a total expectation of uh, around eight points for their, the Bears against this uh, Carolina Panthers defense. So just leaving themselves, you know, a couple points short. And that's all it took, right? 16-13 versus 19-6. The Bears kicking a couple field goals instead of punching one in. That's a swing of like three or four points, um, which is where we get that 16 and 19. And then, of course, Panthers going from 13 down to six if we don't have that punt return for a touchdown. So, yeah, it's kind of split the difference there on the field goals, uh, you know, two field goals where we could have had more left points on the table, it feels like. And while we were doing that, speaking of kickers, I went back and checked our work. Patriots kicker, Chad Ryland, um, he is the second worst kicker in the NFL for those who qualify. 70.6%. There's one worst. Nick, do you know I, who it is? I think we had talked about him before, uh, but I don't remember. 
That would be Graham Gano. That's He's right. the only That's one right. worse. Yes. So there you go. I made sure to check my work in real time here. Yeah, we and, talked about um, Gano on a, on a previous one of these videos. That's why I was like, I know, I remember, but I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's these bad teams tend to come up a lot here. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, as I noted before, right, that that Carolina could have, uh, I had Carolina plus three and a half. So there you go. I'm on the back to the luck thing. But they cover the plus three and a half there on uh, that nonsense in uh, of a, that sorry excuse for a game. Huh, Nick? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was tough. All right, let's let's move on here. Titans and the Buccaneers. Actual score of this game, Tampa wins 20 to six. But. Tampa shouldn't, uh, the game should have been closer. The game yeah, we been... had this at a one score game. Um, you know, Tampa Bay 17, Tennessee 13 by expected scores. So that would have been, you know, still a Tampa Bay win, but this is a little more flattering. A 14 point win, much more flattering than it actually was. This is a pretty, not, not like the super close game. Tennessee, Tampa Bay was certainly better than Tennessee in this one, but closer enough to where Tampa Bay can uh, feel a little bit lucky that, you know, they, they, came away with a, a multi-score win. So this win probability swing in this one was around 27 and a half percent. Yeah. The margin um, felt like mm -hmm. that. Um, look, I was playing against white in fantasy and um, I felt like every time I looked up, he was scoring or they were showing a replay of this massive touchdown mm -hmm. run. And I couldn't, I couldn't unsee it. I couldn't stop seeing it. So yes. how lucky is a, a long touchdown like this, Nick? It, I mean, A, it depends on the distance. B, it depends on the, the offense and the defense. Um, you know, we have a, a by, by DVOA, a bottom half offense in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers going up against a middle of the road defense, Tennessee, technically top half defense by DVOA. And when that happens, when you're in midfield, you know, you're not expected to to score a long touchdown there. So at most, you're getting around a field goal of expectation. So the fact that they get seven points here, four points over expectation just from this one touchdown. Well, Nick, it felt like Tennessee never had the ball in this game, at least every time I looked up. But here they do first and goal opportunity, and they're going to have to end up settling. Yeah, exactly. Just another spot. We've seen this countless times throughout these videos where a team is first and goal. Um, and yeah, that almost gets intercepted right there, that that first down pass. Uh, but we see it countless times. First and goal from the five, first and goal from the seven, the eight, the nine, whatever it ends up being. You're in a position where you're expected to come away with more than a field goal. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but the average expectation uh, is more than a field goal. And, you know, in this case, first and goal from the six for Tennessee against Tampa Bay had an expectation of around five and a half points. And by the fact that they end up settling for a short 27 yard field goal from Nick Folk, that just means they end up coming in around, uh, you know, two and a half points under the drive's maximum expectation here. Yeah, Nick, can I request a study? Because you 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 know these things, you you uh, you dive into them, you have the the data at your fingertips. Rookie quarterbacks in the red zone, because we've seen with Ritter this year, uh, yeah. we see it obviously here with Will Levis. It seems like when they get in the red zone, something happens, and it's just those windows get tighter, and maybe we have to judge them a different way because they're. It seems like it's awfully difficult for them. I would counter argue that with some guy named CJ Stroud, uh, you know, so it, it's not all Ricky quarterbacks. It's just the quality of the quarterback, right? It, it's, <laughs> it's the same thing. We have uh, Bryce Young struggles. Uh, certain guys struggle and certain guys are good because they are good and, and certain quarterbacks aren't as good. And so their expectation is lower, but even adjusting for those expectations, you can run the ball. Um, you could do other things there in the red zone, little, little dump off passes, some screen passes. And uh, that often will lead to touchdowns and, you know, kind of minimize the effect of the quarterback in these situations. I thought we were going to, I thought you were going to call Stroud a anomaly, but I guess not. Uh, this is something that Stroud doesn't do too often. That's throw interceptions. Will Levis will do exactly that here at midfield. Why is this unlucky, Nick? Yeah, I mean, we got two back-to-back -back possessions here. Um, first is this interception right at midfield. And, you know, when you're at midfield, there's some expectation of scoring. It only takes a couple plays to kind of get in field goal range, for example. So that was that one. And then on this next drive, they're in Tampa Bay territory again, as you know, we're rolling the tape here and we see, and they're inside the 40, they're in the 39 yard line. That's in field goal range. And obviously they're not going for a field goal down to touchdowns, 
But again, when you're in this position where you're at least in field goal range, then you still have a shot at a touchdown as well. If they end up going backward here, throwing this long bomb incomplete on fourth and 17 and, and end up coming away with zero points from that uh, third to last and second to last possession they had. They also, of course, scored zero on the last possession as well, which had a small expectation because they didn't really uh, move the ball past midfield. But three straight drives there at the end where they at least kind of got to midfield or even in Tampa Bay territory, showing they're capable, Tennessee, of moving the ball. They just weren't capable of finishing out these drives in this particular situation, but sometimes they will. Yeah, the story is like seven's on the table. Okay, wait, now three is on the table. No, now nothing's on the table. So that's, yeah. that seems to be the theme here. And I'll, I'll just ask you as we wrap up here, what, where are the Pittsburgh Steelers? Luckiest team last six years. What, what happened to them? They don't make the top three? Yeah, I, it's interesting. I ran the expected score for this, and I was surprised Pittsburgh ended up a little unlucky. But I think it's because the play that was really unlucky for the Green Bay Packers doesn't count in the play-by-play -play data. And that was the, the lateral that was a fumble that wasn't counted as a fumble. It was just counted as an incomplete pass. If that play changes, then, of course, the Packers cover, they win. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. But essentially, the Pittsburgh Steelers were a tiny bit unlucky, but not really. I mean, the Packers, if they make that extra point, it's a field goal game. If you know, Jordan Love has two interceptions in the end zone. If one of them is completed for a touchdown, a uh, uh, different ball game. The missed extra point is huge because that goes from a four-point game to a three-point game. A, that's a cover. And B, instead of Jordan Love forcing uh, interceptions in the end zone, they can just kick a field goal to tie the game. So I had massive implications, a single missed extra point. I still think the Steelers were lucky in that one, even though technically our, expect our expected score, excuse me, says they were um, just a tiny, tiny bit unlucky, but they still will enter week 11 as by far the luckiest team entering week 11 in the last six years. Uh, fair enough. I, I had to make sure where they I had to uh, do a quick, uh, you know, assessment of where they still stood because my eyes saw uh, very lucky not to pick on the Steelers. It's becoming uh, quite the funny joke. The way it was, they, a, it was a pretty games. evenly matched game between those two teams, in my opinion. Um, you know, obviously the, the Packers outgained Pittsburgh. So nine straight games where Pittsburgh has been outgained, yet they're six and three. Uh, but part of that was the Packers having a lot of uh, explosive plays, which uh, typically is not a sustainable thing, uh, especially for an offense, the quality of the Packers. So that, I think that's why they were showing a little bit lucky uh, for Green Bay there. I mean, towards the end of the game, Jordan Love had a couple really long completions to get them into scoring territory. So that is a bit lucky on Green Bay's side. So I think overall, Scoreline was, while it was um, unfortunate for Green Bay in that they didn't cover and they didn't win, uh, it, it's one of those where it could go either way. I thought we had two evenly matched teams. Sometimes you'll win by a field goal or a touchdown. Sometimes you'll lose by a field goal or a touchdown. I think uh, I think the assessment of Green Bay uh, being a field goal dog or a three-and-a-half-point dog, um, probably uh, I think Green Bay was the right side there, even though they didn't cover. Yeah, it was like the that was the that was the correct spread looking back. Yeah. Three and a yeah. half. That was three, three and a half. That was bang on. So we basically give you a fourth game in there. Those are the top three right. bad beats. And we do our mandatory Pittsburgh conversation. So that'll wrap it up for week 10 as uh, we look ahead for just Monday night football left on the docket. Make sure you read uh, Nick's entire breakdown on the bad beats, luck rankings on all the uh, Action Network platforms, the award winning app, website for Nick Giffen. I'm Tim Kalinowski. That's week 10.